All right, welcome everyone to the listening session on transitioning to zero emission trucks. We're gonna wait a couple minutes and wait for everyone to join, so just stand by. Muy buenas tardes a todos y gracias por estar a la sesión auditiva de transición a camiones de cero emisión. Vamos a esperar unos algunos minutos más para que se puedan acceder más personas a la presentación y luego comenzamos. Again, welcome to our listening session on transitioning to zero emission trucks. We're going to wait a couple minutes as people join, so please just stand by um, and we'll get started in a couple minutes. De nuevo, muchas gracias por estar esta presentación. Eh, solo esperamos algunos minutos más para que personas se sigan pudiendo a acceder a la presentación. Gracias. Okay, I think we'll go ahead and get started now. Um, so I will hand it over to you, Anne Marie, and we can kick it off. Great, thank you. Hello, my name is Anne Marie Rogers, and I am the Compliance Assistance and Outreach Branch in the Mobile Source Control Division. We greatly appreciate your time this evening. Hola, muy buenas tardes. Mi nombre es Anne Marie. Vamos a comenzar en algunos momentos. Le agradecemos. Bastante su tiempo el día de hoy. We've heard the concern to support truck owners as we transition to zero emission technologies. So this evening, we want to hear your suggestions and feedback for how we can encourage and support this transition. Mientras hablamos de esta presentación, eh, queremos escuchar sus entradas, sus pensamientos para poder a, seguir a continuar con eh, esta conversación el día de hoy. Your feedback for how we improve or create new programs that will smooth the transition for a zero emission transportation system is extremely important. And we want to make sure we hear from all sides, from communities most impacted to those who own the vehicles. Sus entradas al día de hoy son muy importantes. Hablando de eh, los, las transiciones de camiones a cero emisión, queremos escuchar de ustedes. We know how busy everyone is, and we sincerely appreciate you spending this time with us this evening. I will now turn it over to Diane Sanchez, who will be our moderator this evening. Diane? Sabemos que importante es para ustedes, y ahora se lo entregamos a Diane para que continúe. Thank you, Anne-Marie. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Diane Sanchez, and I'm an air pollution specialist here at CARB in the Mobile Source Control Division, and I'll be your facilitator this evening. Muy buenas tardes, mi nombre es Diane Sánchez. Yo soy la especialista de contaminación del aire y voy a ser su facilitadora el día de hoy. I want to wish you all a very warm welcome and thank you all for being here today, uh, this evening and giving us some of your time. Quiero darles la bienvenida el día de hoy y agradecerles por tomar un poco de su tiempo el día de hoy. All right, so we do have Spanish translation available, and in your Zoom controls, you'll see that there's a small globe icon. Please click on that button and select if you'd like to listen to the Spanish interpretation for this meeting. And to hear only the interpreted language, please click mute the original audio. El día de hoy sí estamos proveyendo eh, la interpretación en español para usted, como lo ha estado escuchando. Si usted gusta escuchar la interpretación, En español, usted abajo de su pantalla puede ver un icono en forma de un globo y usted ahí la va a oprimir a la interpretación y escoger su lenguaje que usted desea escucharlo, sea en inglés o en español. Si solamente escuch desea escuchar la, pre eh, la presentación solamente en español, usted enmude su audio original. And if there are any additional questions on how to access interpretation, please write them in the chat box. Y si hay preguntas adicionales. Oh, I think I did that a little too soon. Sorry about that. 
let me um, end the interpretation. Uh -oh. Okay, so um, about that, Leticia, you're back in the main channel. I started it. All too. right, thank you. No <laughs> all right, so you I can say that, that again if that helps, Leticia. Oh, yeah, go ahead, please. Yeah, so if there are any questions about how to access the interpretation, uh, please write them in the chat box. Y para terminar, si hay algunas preguntas que ustedes sigan teniendo acerca de cómo acceder a la presentación, solamente usted déjenos saber por la cajita del chat. Perfect, thank you. Uh, so we'll, we're now going to stop the sequential translation, and at this time, our interpreters will begin simultaneous Spanish interpretation. Y ahora vamos a parar eh, la interpretación consecutiva y va a escuchar la interpretación solamente en simultáneo. Okay, so I started the um, interpretation, so you should be able to move over now if you'd like to listen to Spanish. Um, and just to introduce myself, my name is Olivia Lane. I will be assisting Diane today for our meeting. Um, so I don't see any issues, and I think we've um, we've started our interpretation success successfully. So um, we can go ahead and proceed now, Diane. Olivia, okay. just really quick, can you? Yeah. I think as a host, I can't enable this. Can you click more and see if you can enable the closed captioning also? Okay. Let's see. Hmm, I'm not seeing that option for us. Okay, I think it might not do it live in our Zoom account, but I know that we do have the transcriptions available in the recording. Okay. So if anyone is having, uh, is hard of hearing or is having any issues with the audio, um, hopefully we'll have that available for you in the recording. All right, thank you, Katie. All right, perfect. Uh, so uh, just a reminder, today's meeting will be recorded and we'll post that recording on the program website. We'll also send out a follow-up email when the recording is available. And we'll share a survey at the end of this meeting uh, where we'll encourage all participants to fill that survey out on their own time. So before we go any further, uh, I would like to take a few minutes to introduce some CARB staff to you all. Uh, so first I'll hand it off to Jessica so she can introduce herself. Good evening, everyone. My name is Jessica Johnson and I'm a manager here at the California Air Resources Board. Um, I oversee a number of truck and school bus outreach programs and grants. So I'm very grateful for everyone's participation here tonight. Um, I'll now hand it off to Bruce Tudor. Thank you, Jessica, and I am Bruce Tudor in the Mobile Source Control Division, the Compliance Assistance and Outreach Branch. Uh, I am an Air Resources Supervisor One, and among many things, I work on outreach and a number of mobile source, uh, heavy duty mobile source programs. And I will turn it over to Katie. Thanks, Bruce. My name is Katie King. I'll be helping with the Q&A for today and um, allowing people to speak so we can get your comments. And I'm an air pollution specialist with the heavy duty incentives and training uh, section. I'll pass it over to Stephen. Oh, Stephen, looks like you're muted. Thank you. Sorry about that. No worries. Um, my name is Stephen Toft. Um, I'll be helping with uh, any questions you have about uh, any technical assistance you might need with the Zoom. Um, I work in compliance assistance and outreach, um, and I'll hand it off to Noemi. Noemi, if you're speaking, you're muted. Thank you. Hi, this is Noemi. I'm from the Plane Transportation Outreach section. And next is Sandra. Good evening, everyone. My name is Sandra Wynn, uh, ARE, uh, 
Air Resource Engineer with the Incentives Technology and Advancement Branch. Um, I'm the on-road lead for the Moyer program, and I'm, I'm assisting with this year's Incentive Program Advisory Group, known as IPAG. So our efforts this year are helping further accelerate zero emission vehicles and the equity work in the Call Moyer program. So I'll be here assisting with any questions you guys have. Perfect. Thank you, everyone, for those introductions. And there are other CARB staff here, but they, they might be introducing themselves later on um, as we continue through our discussion. So uh, moving on, uh, just a couple more logistical things here. We'll be using the raise hand feature today. And uh, that might be in a few different places, depending on what version of Zoom you're using. So on the bottom control panel, you should have an option to raise your hand. We'll also be using the question and answer box today for comments or questions, uh, which you can find on your Zoom control panel. It was necessary that we change this meeting, <clears throat> excuse me, to a Zoom webinar because we had so many folks uh, registered for this event, which is awesome. Uh, so while we do still have the option to call in and listen to this event, if you're on the phone line, you might not have the option to raise your hand and speak. And some of the polling functions might be a little limited. So just want to let you know, if you do have any comments or questions, I encourage you to email movingca at arb.ca.gov. And I did see a question about that in the chat. So we have staff monitoring this email and they'll bring your comments to our attention. So again, that's M-O-V-I-N-G-C-A at arb.ca.gov. And that should be in the chat as well. Uh, so again, if you have any technical questions, uh, Stephen Toft will be able to assist you. And you can send a, send a message in the chat if you have any questions about our instructions or if you need any help. So again, as a reminder, use the Q&A box for questions and comments and use the chat only if you have Zoom or technical questions. And we'll also be using the chat box throughout today's meeting to share links to various resources. So. If you'd like to follow along with our slides, uh, Stephen has linked the slides in the chat. All right, um, and then next slide, please. Okay, so you can um, unmute yourself after you raise your hand and your name has been called on, and then you can click mute and unmute on the bottom left corner of your Zoom controls. All right, and uh, one more slide, awesome. So. For today's meeting, we will be asking all attendees and CARB staff uh, to follow a set of meeting agreements. And so these are uh, just some simple agreements. For example, let's be respectful. Uh, we wanna stay kind to each other and just create a space where everyone feels comfortable sharing their opinions and experiences. We wanna take space as well as make space. So if you're typically a quiet person, uh, challenge yourself to take some more space in this conversation. And if you typically talk a lot, let's be mindful and leave room for the quieter voices as well. And we wanna to listen to understand. So we wanna practice actively listening to each other. And finally, we really wanna develop solutions with equity in mind. So remember that equity is this idea that not everyone starts off from the same place. And we might have some unique advantages or barriers. And we wanna recognize those barriers that exist in some communities in order to tailor solutions uh, to their unique challenges. So that said, today we're really eager to hear from the people in our state who are impacted by poor air quality and have been advocating for cleaner transportation. And we also want to hear from the medium and heavy duty truck owners, especially the small fleets, who will benefit most from improvements to the funding programs and other resources. And so both of these perspectives are very important in this conversation. And while we might have differing viewpoints, we want this meeting to be focused on overcoming barriers that truck owners may face as we transition to a cleaner transportation system in California. We also want to remind everyone that today's discussion will be focused on financial and non-financial support to transition to cleaner transportation. So we won't necessarily be answering questions or suggestions for regulations currently um, that are in place or are currently being developed. So again, we're trying to focus on the financial and non-financial supports. 
So that said, at this time, I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Olivia Lane, and she's going to go through some instructions uh, and give a very brief presentation before we get into that main listening portion of this event. It's all you, Olivia. All right. Thank you, Diane. Okay, so since we have um, a lot of attendees today in our meeting, we wanted to use a polling program so that everyone's thoughts can be heard. Um, so we're gonna take a moment to test this feature out. Um, so first I'll go over some instructions. So we're using Poll Everywhere and to access this um, platform, you can find a link to this um, program in the chat or you can go to pollev.com forward slash home and enter the username Crystal Laza 824, which is spelled C H R I S T A L L A Z A 824. Or you can use your phone to scan the QR code on the screen. Um, you can also text Crystal Laza 824 to 22333. The text option won't work for some of our question types today, but we will make sure you have a way to offer feedback on every question. So at this time, I'm going to instruct you to follow one of these options, and I will work on getting our first poll launched. All right, so if, remember, if you have any questions about um, accessing this poll everywhere, feel free to um, reach out to Stephen in the chat. And so our first question is, what best describes you? So are you a truck owner? Are you a clean air advocate? Are you a concerned citizen? Do you represent a vehicle manufacturer? Are you an environmental or community organization? Are you a state or local representative? Are you a truck financier? Are you an environmental or other consultant? And then we also have the option for other if none of that describes you. Okay, we, it looks like we have some results coming in. So thank you everyone for participating. And again, if you're having trouble accessing Poll Everywhere, feel free to reach out to Steven in the chat and he'll help you out. But again, you can go to pollev.com forward slash home and enter in Crystal Laza 824. Okay, so I see some more results. And just to, we'll wait a couple more seconds and then we'll share some of those results. All right, thank you everyone for taking part. It's important that we know who we're talking to. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and share our responses. All right, so it looks like we have a mixed bag tonight. We have some truck owners. That's great. Looks like we have um, quite a few state or local representatives and we have some environmental consultants or other consultants. Okay, great. Thank you everyone for participating. We'll go ahead and move on now, but feel free to um, enter in your response. If you bring that up on your computer, you can still answer those questions. All right. Okay, so I'm gonna close that out now. All right. Okay, so now I'm gonna go on to a brief presentation. So um, first I'm gonna go over the goals of this listening session. So today we're really looking to hear feedback and suggestions for how CARB can further support truck owners as we transition to zero emission vehicles. And the comments heard today will help us and other agencies to strategize and develop California's next steps. Um, so before we do this, we first would like to share a little bit about our goals and the current work CARB is doing to encourage and support this transition. Um, Senate Bill 372 um, or SB 372 directs CARB to develop an assistance program that will help to support the adoption of medium and heavy duty zero emission vehicles. So this includes financial support such as incentives and loan programs and non-financial support such as web resources and training. So today's effort is also a continuation of many efforts that have already been taking place throughout our agency. So for example, last fall CARB hosted a more general truck listening session 
that focused on all things trucks. And we heard the importance of moving towards zero emission technologies, such as battery electric and fuel cell electric technology in order to re reduce emissions in our communities. Also last fall at the November board meeting, CARB staff heard strong interest from several board members in helping to further, the, further accelerate the use of zero emission vehicles and equity work in the on-road on Moyer program and the on-road, oh my gosh, <laughs> excuse me, and the on-road voucher incentive program or VIP. So in response to that request, request, the incentive program advisory group or IPAG was created and includes Vice Chair Sandra Berg and board men, members da, Davin, oh my gosh, sorry, Davina Hurt and Gideon Krakow. Okay, so today we will build on these conversations and the feedback heard during this effort. And then later in my slides, I'll discuss um, some of the reoccurring themes that we have been hearing at these various meetings and how CARB is responding. Okay, so why are we making this transition? So in order to protect public health and meet our air quality standards and our greenhouse gas emission goals, um, California is working to transition truck and bus fleets to zero emission technologies by 2045, everywhere feasible, and significantly earlier for certain market segments, such as drainage trucks that operate at our ports. So we are doing this in a number of ways, and we are also making sure that we are con continuing to clean up the existing trucks on the road, as shown in this infographic. We are enhancing inspection and maintenance requirements and requiring cleaner fuels and engines for diesel vehicles. The other, other pillars in this transition are sales mandates, which is requiring manufacturers to sell zero emission trucks, and then requirements for fleets to phase in these technologies. This ensures the supply and the demand side are set for the zero emission market. And lastly, we have the pillar for incentives and recognition. So we're hoping to expand and improve upon these pillars, specifically the incentives and recognition pillars, and maybe even a new pillar that represents support such as training and guidance resources. So CARB offers several different kind, kinds of financial incentives to support the purchase and use of zero emission trucks. This slide shows a number of different programs that are currently in place or that are in development. There are funding programs that focus on funding the replacement of, of older vehicles or that offer loan assistance. There are programs that address the upfront costs of these electric trucks through point of sale rebates or that address the cost of fuel. One program that will be launched very soon is the Innovative Small E-Fleets pilot. Through this program, $25 million will be dedicated to helping small fleets make the transition to zero emission trucks. And this list is not exhaustive and other state agencies are also doing, doing work in the space. For example, the California Energy Commission has launched the Energize program, which offers commercial fleet owners funding for medium and heavy duty battery electric and hydrogen fuel cell fueling infrastructure. CARB also offers several non-financial support programs that hope to assist in the purchase and use of zero emission trucks. For example, there are a number of web pages that offer information on the technology itself how to determine future costs, how to find funding and more. For example, staff has been hard at work developing the ZEV truck stop webpage where you can find information on regulations, incentives, basic, basic background on the new tech technology, um, catalogs of available vehicles and much more. So we'll share a link to that website now in the chat. There are also regulatory training courses and educational events that give participants an overview of regulations, as well as courses that cover planning for the use of electric trucks. For example, the next one-stop truck event is scheduled for August 3rd next week. 
This is a day long program with different courses available, including a session on advanced technology. And we're gonna share the information for this event in the chat as well. This event will offer interpretation in Spanish and Punjabi. And in the future, CARB is planning to host another educational event focused entirely on zero emission trucks and will include different sessions such as identifying fleet needs, planning for infrastructure and more. We're also um, hoping to share case studies where you can hear from folks who made these changes. And we also plan to offer technical assistance to fleets. A new program was also launched that will offer recognition for fleets that make a commitment to electrifying their fleet and then eventually the companies that hire them as well. Lots of work is happening at CARB and at other state agencies to better support truck owners and to encourage the adoption of these technologies. This is a really great time to offer feedback as these programs are be being developed right now. Okay, so with that being said, we have been hearing um, feedback for, from state stakeholders on many topics over the past year during our many public events. And most central to our discussion today, we have been hearing the call to replace diesel trucks with zero emission trucks as soon as possible. We have been hearing that we need to focus on funding the electrification of small fleets. And this was a major theme at the most recent IPAG work group, as well as the importance of equitable access to workforce development and capacity building or the building of skills and knowledge. We have heard that one way to start would be to explore partnerships with community-based organizations who have the insight on how to conduct this type of outreach, because we are hearing that marginalized communities are not receiving outreach and not hearing about funding opportunities. We have also heard that fueling infrastructure, install costs, land availability, public access, and charging times all pose challenges, and funding is needed to set up this infrastructure. At the same time, we have heard proposed regulatory deadlines are coming too soon for fleets to install fueling infrastructure in time. And also truck owners need a streamlined funding application pro process and timeline. And of course, this is just a summary of the reoccurring themes we have heard and so much more input is being gathered all the time. Okay, so lastly, I wanna highlight how CARB is responding to some of this feedback. Um, CARB is in the process of developing a zero emission truck regulation, which will help accelerate the zero emission truck market. Staff has been hard at work on this regulation and they had a workshop earlier this week on extensions and other provisions, which was recorded and will be posted for viewing. And this and other information about the proposed regulation can be found on the Advanced Clean Fleet Regulation webpage. We are also developing new funding programs that focus on small fleets, such as the innovative small e-fleet pilot that I mentioned earlier. This program will provide vouchers to truck companies with less than 20 vehicles in their fleet. CARB, the Governor's Office of Business and Economic Development, the California Energy Commission, and other agencies and utilities in the state are working closely to ensure infrastructure is available for truck fleets investments and strategic planning are happening throughout the state. And as I mentioned earlier, the Energy Commission has launched the first incentive project for zero emission truck and bus infrastructure. And finally, we are working on efforts like our goals here today, hearing feedback on how we can improve our support programs and conduct better outreach. So that concludes the presentation portion of today's event. Um, so we're going to pause now and answer any questions that relate to the information shared in the slides today. So I'll hand it back to you, Diane. Awesome. Thank you, Olivia, for that. Um, so to answer or to ask a question about the slides, uh, you may now raise your hands or write your question or comment in the Q&A box. And as a reminder, at this time, we're covering questions about the slides. And after we take a couple questions, we're gonna move on to the feedback portion of today's meeting. All right, uh, Katie, if you could please call on our first raise hand. 
There are currently no raised hands and no open questions. All right, uh, we can give it a maybe a couple uh, seconds here. And if we don't see any uh, questions on the slides, then we can move into our uh, our feedback portion. Okay, we do have a raised hand. Um, also, feel free to correct me if I mispronounce anyone's name. I try to write down the pronunciation afterwards so it only happens once. Um, so Nahui, I will unmute your mic and you will get the prompt to unmute on your end as well. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. My question is on the slides. Um, I see that it mentions collaborating with other state agencies and utilities and infrastructure. Is there anything that's being done like um, talking to cities at all about like truck routes, anything like that? Uh, so Annalisa, would you have any, um, any information on infrastructure and how we're collaborating with other cities on perhaps truck routes? Or if there's another staff member that can answer that question, that would be great. Sure, thank you. Hi, this is Annalisa Bevan. I'm the Zero Emission Infrastructure Specialist for CARB. Um, in terms of uh, working directly with cities um, and establishing infrastructure, that's something that needs to happen. Um, CARB isn't doing it specifically right now, um, but we are recommending that um, within funding programs where there are proposals to put in public infrastructure, or where fleets are uh, working to put in infrastructure that they work with um, the city uh, and the communities in which they're proposing to put infrastructure. But that's definitely something that um, needs to happen and um, something that we're happy to help with. Awesome. And I also want to mention that um, for AB 617, there are local programs um, based on the AB 617 communities who have prioritized for example, um, truck uh, neighborhood truck route studies that have been prioritizing these types of projects. So in those cases, they would be collaborating with the cities with CARB as a partner. Okay, thank you. Yeah, awesome. And all right, do we have any other questions? Yes, one more just came in. Um, it also is partially a comment. So I will read that from Tim Knox in the Q&A. I read in a San Diego Union Tribune article today saying that a nearby school district just purchased eight bi-directional charging electric buses using mostly state and federal grant money. I was glad to see that. Were, will there be enough funding available for most other districts to do the same? Oh, that's a great question. Um, so I'll hand this over to Jessica. Hi, everybody. Uh, thanks, Tim. I'm uh, glad to hear that uh, uh, we're making the news down there. Um, there are a number of school bus incentives programs. Um, most recently, the budget um, allotted $1.5 billion with a B dollars towards zero emission school bus replacements. And that's going to be uh, implemented uh, through uh, California HBIP and um, in partnership with the California Energy Commission. Um, there's uh, funding for school buses and infrastructure in, in that package. And that's really building on a number of um, smaller allocations that we've had over the years. And um, we do think it'll be enough to fund several thousand school buses, but we know that there are um, something like 24,000 school buses in the state. So it's gonna take a long time to make all those replacements. Um, but we're optimistic about the, the school districts that have so far had good experiences um, with the school buses and those that are learning from some of those early prototypes. And so uh, we're gonna keep plugging at it. That's actually one of, one of the main assignments in my section. Um, so, to answer your question in uh, one sentence, um, there's not enough funding allocated so far, but we're optimistic that um, we're gonna keep that moving. So thanks for the comment and you can feel free to email me if you have further questions or uh, want further information. Thank you, Jessica. All right, any other questions? There are no additional raised hands and no open questions. Awesome. 
All right, so I think we can move on then um, to our next portion. And so again, I just want to reiterate that our goal today is to find solutions and improve our support programs. And we're all excited about reducing people's exposure to harmful air pollution uh, with trucks that don't emit toxic exhaust. However, uh, we do want to start by acknowledging the fact that there are many challenges that exist when it comes to purchasing and using zero emission trucks. So we want to keep those challenges in mind when we su suggest solutions and improvements. So a quick reminder to CARB staff and our participants, uh, let's remember to be respectful, take space, make space, and listen to understand. And with that, um, Olivia is going to uh, put up our first question uh, with Poll Everywhere, uh, which is, what barriers will truck owners experience in your community when attempting to use zero emission trucks? So uh, Olivia has posted the instructions here. Uh, you can either join by web or by text, and then you can answer this question. What barriers will truck owners experience in your community when attempting to use zero emission trucks? And as folks start to answer, we'll, um, Olivia will show the answers that come up as well. All right, I'm gonna wait a couple more seconds with the instructions on the screen, just so everyone yeah. can see that. And then I will switch over to showing the responses. And again, if you have any uh, technical uh, trouble, just go ahead and send Stephen a, a chat. All right, it looks like we have some responses flowing in, so I'm going to go ahead and show those. All right. All right. So availability, the power infrastructure, lack of infrastructure. Okay, so we're seeing a theme here. Yep, lack of public charging, the cost, power outages, lack of high power DC fast charging, cost number one issue, grid capacity, Again, infrastructure, cost, yep, charging. So it looks like we're seeing uh, some common themes here. So I see a lot of uh, issues with charging or um, infrastructure and cost. These seem to be some of the main themes. And uh, so I want to say that CARB staff is noting all of your input here. Uh, we're making note of it, and we are going to open up for a broader discussion. So thank you so much for answering these. We're definitely going to dive deeper into your answers. So thank you again. Um, so we're going to do another question, uh, and then we'll start discussing solutions to these challenges. So you've just uh, put down your feedback on what are the challenges. Now let's talk about how we can fix that. So Olivia is going to put the next question up, which is, how do we overcome these barriers to ensure zero emission trucks become accessible in your community? Okay, give me one minute and then I will have yeah. that up on the screen. Yeah, and thank you again, everyone who's answering. Again, we're noting all your responses and we will be diving deeper into your responses. Okay, great. So. Um, is that screen up for you, Diane? Yep, I see it. Right, cool. Yeah, so and here's we... the question, and we see the instructions, again, either by web or by text. Okay, I'll go ahead and share some of the responses now. All right, so funding for power distribution, charging as a service, ZEV trucks as a service, purchase incentives and vouchers, working with the California Truck Association to outreach to their members, 
enough charging infrastructure, yep. Reducing red tape for vehicles, offering if zero emissions. Generous financial incentives. Mm -hmm. Streamlining utility upgrade processes and permitting. Hold community meetings. All right, flexibility in the proposed regulations. More funding. Okay, so seeing a lot of more funding. Okay, generators for blackouts. Okay, we're seeing outreach again to the community. Okay, so it sounds like we need more outreach to provide information on that. Um, okay, financial resources to low-income communities. All right, so these are really great responses and we're seeing some themes here as well. So we're excited to dive deeper into these as well. Again, noting all of these responses, thank you so much for this feedback. And we will definitely be diving in deeper. Um, so we have one more question before we open it up for a larger discussion. And so the next question is going to be a ranking exercise. And so I'll read off some of the options that you have, and then you can rank them according to what you think is most important. So uh, rank your options by clicking on the box and you can move the arrow up and down on poll everywhere. And so the higher you place the option, the more importance you place on it. And then we'll open it up to discussion once you're done ranking. And please take your time and we'll give you a few minutes to submit your answers. Again, I just want to note that these are just a few ideas that we have for this question. And there are definitely other options outside of what we've written here. And you'll definitely have the opportunity after this uh, to discuss some of those that are not in uh, this, this question as answers. So the question is, what types of non-financial support should we make available to fleets? For example, training classes on the basics of zero emission technology and operation, training classes on new regulatory requirements, testimonials from fleet owners who have used zero emission vehicles, recognition for fleets that use zero emission trucks, assistance choosing the right vehicles for your fleet, assistance for planning charging infrastructure needs, and capacity building for local organizations so that they can assist their community members. Again, these are just a few ideas that staff had, but we'll open it up for the discussion after this and we can chat more about your ideas. And in case you're wondering, the reason that we're using this poll is because we have a big audience. So we wanna make sure that everyone at least gets to answer some of these polls and gets their feedback in. And then we can open it up to discussion where maybe not as many people uh, might necessarily have a chance to speak, but this is a way for us to get kind of that larger, um, uh, larger participation. All right, looks like we have some responses. Um... Still on the on the smaller side for responses. So if you do have trouble using the poll everywhere, just a reminder that Stephen is available in the chat if you need further instructions for how to participate. Also, if you just like to respond using the Q and A, you can do that as well. Um, feel free to just type in there. You know, I think that this is really important um, for for non financial support or something like that. So go ahead and respond any way you feel. Um, and like Diane said, we will open it up for discussion as well. So I'm gonna share our responses now. Okay, so Diane, do you wanna look at our responses? Yeah, okay. So right now in uh, first place in terms of what people think would be really effective is assistance for planning charging infrastructure needs. And that's followed by training classes on the basics of zero emission technology and operation, okay and also capacity building for local organizations so that they can assist their community members. All right, very good. So all really great responses, everyone. Thank you so much. And so um, at this time, we'd like to open the floor to suggestions and to brainstorm what sort of support we can offer fleets uh, other than assisting with money. Uh, so please raise your hand to be added to the speaking queue or write your comment in the Q&A box. And uh, Olivia will also have the poll everywhere uh, question open again in the background. And this time it's the same question, but instead of ranking, uh, you can put your own ideas that might not have been an option. So you can respond in 
either uh, by raising your hand, Q&A box, or you can uh, submit your feedback in the poll. And that said, uh, Katie, would you please call on our raised hands? We don't have any raised hands currently, but we do have one open question in the Q&A. Okay. So this one's from Mark Rose. Can you make funding available for disruptive battery and solar technologies? Ours may end the range limitations for long haul class eight trucks and generate enough electricity to power fleets from PV can canopies over parking and driveways along with rooftop PV. Can you incentivize kits to convert trucks and buses from diesel to full battery electric equally with replacing entire vehicles? This technology is now available from one of our allies. All right, so let's take that question in its different parts. So the first part regarding um, grid energy, uh, let's go to Annalisa. So um, that's if we can make funding available for disruptive battery and solar technologies. So I think that might be outside um, CARB's scope and um, more appropriate uh, as a question for the Energy Commission. Um, we can certainly pass that along to our colleagues at uh, CEC. Okay, so Mark, we'll follow up with you um, after discussing with uh, those colleagues at CEC for that first part of your question. And then, uh, so the second part of your question is, can you incentivize kits to convert trucks and buses uh, from diesel to full battery electric? So um, Bruce or another staff member, do you have uh, any answer to incentivizing kits to convert trucks? I'll jump in on that. Um, as you know, most people know, we have typically incentivized uh, complete vehicles. Um, as you know, we, we've found that a, a complete vehicle usually makes for the, the best product. Um, I don't know that we wouldn't consider it. So I think as Annalisa said, it's the kind of thing that we may wanna take back to, uh, to our, our folks in the incentive group and, uh, and run that to them. All right, uh, thank you very much. And uh, Katie, do you have uh, another question for us? Um, we do have a raised hand. So LaDonna, I will unmute your mic and you should get a prompt to unmute on your end as well. Okay, good evening. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, Yes. good evening, LaDonna Williams. All positives possible. I just wanted to make a request if there is another technology that you could use like maybe a touchscreen or having one spot area where we can answer. I saw the results and I really don't think you're getting a, a real accurate um, result because I wasn't able to, to input my uh, thoughts and opinions. And I got a couple of texts here that said the same thing um, because it seems like having to do this bouncing back and forth. And I know we got to come up to speed, but is there another technology that you could use that puts the screen right in front of us where we ain't got to come out go to another screen, too much bouncing around. So anyway, if not, I guess I'll eventually come up to speed, but right now you're not getting my results. So I just wanted to add that, thank you. Got it, thank you very much for letting us know. Um, yeah, this is uh, this was kind of a, a new thing for us. So we'll definitely keep that in mind. I, I see what you're saying because we do have over 100 participants right now, but not as many have been able to use the poll. So I would say that if you um, are having trouble getting to that poll everywhere, then I would just go ahead and write your comments or um, uh, feedback in the Q&A box, which should be right there on Zoom. But yeah, thank you for that feedback. And you know, now we know that this might not be the best way for us to get feedback. So Thank yeah, you very was, much for pointing that out. Yeah. I was just going to say because I have had that 2233 previously. Mm -hmm. And when I went there, I typed in your name because you got kind of a long name. Yeah. But it kicked me back to someone else's, I guess, that mm -hmm. used that prior. And then by the time I recognized and realized it wasn't going to you, the um, poll was over. So if you, I, it seemed to me like someone mentioned there was a sort of a low response compared to how many people are, you know, attending the meeting. So I don't know if I'm the only one experiencing that, but that might be the reason why your response is not as high as you guys would like to see. 
Yeah, thank yeah. you, LaDonna. I wanted to add, Diane, that um, just in case anyone doesn't get to add feedback with the polls, we are going to share a another way of answering these questions at the end of our uh, meeting today. And it's just a, a basic outlook survey where you're gonna uh, just have all the questions in front of you and you can, you can respond with long answers um, and take your time. So there will be another way to answer all these questions as well at the very end, um, which might be a little bit easier to use. Yeah, thank you for pointing that out too, Olivia. Um, all right, so um, I believe that there was another question in the Moving California email. Yeah, thanks, Diane. Um, it wasn't necessarily a question, it was a comment, and I will read it. It's from Jasmine Beltran. She is saying that when it comes to Southeast Los Angeles, the best way to get uh, to owners of small fleets is to go out to them personally and connect with them and present programs and information to them. Boots on the ground efforts, um, having some sort of application help and help with gather, gathering all of the documents that are needed. Um, she said also getting the cities to have a department for that is also a way um, or just uh, some way to get the cities to have that information too. Um, or developing that outreach is best is, is to do it at a personal level, get the information to them, maybe through a task force with some types of training. So she offered a lot of different suggestions in there. So thank you, Jasmine. Yeah, thank you, Jasmine. Those are great suggestions. And I, I also want to point out that I know for the Southeast LA AB617 folks over at South Coast AQMD, I believe that they do have a list of small fleets and they have been personally uh, reaching out to those small fleets to do um, different types of outreach. So that's something that you know we can definitely keep in mind, but I really like all the suggestions that you offered, um, a lot more robust outreach and that personal boots on the ground, one-on-one -on -one type of outreach, that's really good. So thank you for, for putting that and good to see you. I, I used to be at South Coast AQMD and used to talk to Jasmine a lot. So it's really nice to see you here. All right, any other questions? Yes, we do have some more raised hands. Also, if for anyone um, submitting a verbal comment, if you could just state your name and affiliation, we would appreciate it. Um, so next we have Indrani. I will unmute your mic and you should receive a prompt to unmute on your end as well. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Indrani Voledi. I am uh, with uh, Toyota Material Handling. Um, and one of the questions that I actually have is um, there is a lot of programs that are going within California. Are there um, collaborative um, efforts that are being done with California and other states? If so, um, could you give us some idea on um, what is the current collaboration on um, zero emissions trucks at this point of time? Thank you. Yeah, um, Diane, I was going to say, I feel like that was a good question for Bruce or Craig maybe to pop in and talk about um, what's going on with our other states with our um, signing on to, to do um, zero emission truck regulations. Craig or you know, Bruce, do you guys want to talk about that? You know, I'll jump in first. And I was just looking at the Q&A questions. This might be a good one to combine with uh, the Q&A question regarding the number of vehicles that are out there. And Craig will be much better at, at putting some fine points on that. But as far as collaboration amongst other states, um, first of all, I will say that, that at least five, I can't keep track because it keeps increasing, at least five states have adopted our previous uh, heavy duty vehicle regulation, which is the advanced clean truck regulations requiring stay, uh, requiring that manufacturers sell a certain amount of zero emission vehicles in their states. A number of states, again, last I looked about 17, um, including the ones that, that the, the five or so that, that have adopted our rules, uh, have signed on to a, memor a memorandum of understanding to, to promote uh, zero emission heavy duty vehicles within their state. Um, as far as if, if that was what you were getting at when you talked about collaboration, um, and I'm going to just quickly touch on 
that other question, which I think also can can be combined along with that a little bit. And the question was pertaining to, uh, you know, a lot of information is out there about zero emission cars and motorcycles being developed. But some people haven't heard a lot about trucks. Um, we actually just had a work shop meeting on that two days ago. Uh, that was one of the main main subjects. Um, obviously, those are a little bit more of a kind of a technical workshop. But there are a number of vehicles that are already out there. All of the major manufacturers are are producing electric vehicles with some of them coming and even all the way up to, you know, large heavy duty trucks. Uh, some of them are already in the marketplace. A number of the lighter ones are in the marketplace. And as I said, Craig is the uh, lead on that regulatory development and that work group. So I think he could probably put some some finer points on that. Yeah, thanks, Bruce. Uh, Craig Durian, I'm managing the, the efforts uh, currently for the advanced clean fleets regulation that uh, everybody's heard about. So uh, Bruce is absolutely right. Um, and I, I just wanna add a little bit to the, the point that Bruce made about there's like six, actually six now, and maybe even seven other states that have adopted our advanced clean trucks regulation. Um, the whole West Coast, the whole West Coast now is on board to start bringing zero emission trucks to the, uh, to, to the market. So um, what that does is it, is it um, allows for these trucks to uh, enter these larger fleets. It allows for uh, the rollout of more infrastructure. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a wonderful program that's happening. So, so you may not see these, and Bruce did mention that there's, there's several, all of the, the major truck manufacturers have made announcements uh, that they either already have product available or, or they, they do have plans to produce products in the next year or two. And, um, and, and, and that is part of the advanced clean trucks regulation that went into effect uh, literally two years ago from, from now. So, so yeah, all of the major manufacturers will be bringing trucks to the market. You may not see them on the road today, but there's a lot of demos out there. Uh, there's uh, uh, some companies are buying them today and starting to put them into service. You, you probably may have heard announcements from Amazon and FedEx and, and even UPS is jumping on board. So, so there's a lot of activity in the, in the medium and heavy duty truck market. And um, even though you may not see them, you will. These trucks are out there, they're coming. And over the course of the next uh, you know, several years, uh, there's gonna be a lot available. Uh, even, even in the secondary market, you'll start seeing these trucks um, available to purchase and, and use. So pr pretty, pretty, pretty neat times right now. You know, there's one other thing that along these lines that I think maybe is worth mentioning because there is so much concern about infrastructure. I mean, obviously, we've heard it for quite some time. We've heard it tonight. Um, it's important to note that some of the major manufacturers are already starting to uh, will have plans and commitments to start putting in infrastructure around the United States um, to support uh, heavy duty vehicles. So there's really a, a, a joint effort or a, you know, a, a, a kind of a combined effort by a lot of folks to uh, make this happen. Um, just for reference, I'll go ahead and read the question that Craig and Bruce just responded to out of the Q&A. So that was from Tim Knox. I follow EV developments pretty closely and hear lots about companies making and selling electric cars and bikes, but haven't heard much about companies developing and manufacturing electric trucks and buses. Which companies are leading this and what's the status? And I did want to add, we also have um, the HFIT program has a vehicle catalog, which shows available electric um, truck and bus by body type. So I'll go ahead and post that link to that vehicle catalog in response to that question as well. And we did have another raised hand. So Nuhui, I will unmute your mic and you should get the prompt to unmute on your end as well. Hi, so I just wanted to ask if there was anything that's being done in collaboration with like the Civic Action Corps um, so I know that they just did like uh, like a climate action thing. So is there gonna be anything done with like in recruiting youth to do like that example of, uh, uh, of doing the boots on the ground outreach kind of thing? Or is there anything else that they're being enlisted to so that they can be a part of the zero emissions uh, trucks? 
Yeah, thank you, Maui. That's a really good question. Um, and in terms of uh, boots on the ground and like outreach, uh, Tab, would you happen to know if we have um, any type of collaboration with uh, Civic Action or similar programs to get youth involved? Yeah, I'm trying to think. We have um, we have some workforce training and development efforts that we are working on with like the Energy Commission um, that we're working to engage youth on that. Um, and I know a lot of that is focusing on you know career development and career training type information, um, which definitely is I think relevant and helpful to, <laughs> to uh, you know looking at, at trucks um but i also think through some of our outreach efforts there may be um we've had while the focus has been more on light duty i do think it's important for us to start thinking more about how to how to, how to talk about you know light duty and heavy duty and i'm thinking specifically through some of our student fellowship opportunities at schools um so that's definitely a suggestion we can take back and think more about how to make that more robust in, in our outreach programs. Yeah, and that's a really great suggestion, Nawi, to, con uh, to connect with those folks. So I'd love to follow up with you um, maybe sometime early next week and talk to you more about that. I think that's a really excellent uh, way to get the outreach out there with the youth. All right, um, so let's um, let's move on to our next discussion. And so we won't do the poll everywhere because like we've heard, it, it hasn't been um, super easy to navigate. So um, Olivia will put up the poll everywhere question, but we're gonna open it up for discussion. So we won't necessarily have to do it through the poll everywhere. So don't worry about answering there. We'll have it up so that you can see the question. And if you'd like to answer, you're welcome to, but we'll we'll open it up to discussion. I think that might be the best yeah. way. So, also, I do wanna mention, Diane, before we move on, there was um, about uh, 20, 30 results from the last one that we did receive okay. while everyone was talking. So we will take those notes back and um, we will be sharing the polling results on, on our webpage afterwards. So. Don't worry, we are seeing those those responses as well. But um, for going forward, we'll just launch this one, but jump into conversation instead. Perfect. Thank you, Olivia. All right. So our next question will be: How can CARB and other state agencies improve funding programs to make zero emission trucks more accessible to smaller fleets or single owner and operators? And so. Um, Here's the question. We did have some examples prior that you know we wanted to throw out there, but again, we want to hear what you think. Some of the examples we had were to process the lowest income applicants first, fund lowest income applicants first, make the application process easier, expand training opportunities for applying to programs, and expand uh, pl publicity of available programs. So those are just some examples that we had in the poll. Um, but at this time, uh, we'd like to open the floor and hear what you think. Um, how can we improve these funding programs and make the zero emission trucks more accessible? OK, we do have a raised hand. So Kevin, I will unmute your mic, and you should receive a prompt to unmute on your end as well. Hi, can you guys hear me? Yes. Oh, hi. Uh, my name is Kevin McGuy. I'm with uh, Navistar. And I think uh, one of the ways to make zero emission trucks available to um, <clears throat> low, lower income or smaller fleets is to quickly and, and effectively deploy the public charging network. A lot of these fleets rely exclusively on public fueling right now. So they don't have depots where they can charge. They don't have the land. They don't have the, the capital to do that. I think that one of the concerns um, as an OEM is that the deployment of infrastructure, uh, depot charging and public is not gonna keep pace with the deployment of trucks that's required by ACF and ACC. There needs to be some mechanisms in place that ensure that the infrastructure will be there to support the trucks. I think that if we're gonna deploy trucks, we have to do it right. And we have to have this overall ecosystem 
including uh, specifically the charging network. So if we can ramp up public charging and find a way to ensure that public charging will be ramped up and will be there to keep pace with ACF and ACT, I think that's one way of getting people into the trucks, getting into the trucks faster, especially for those that rely on the, the, the smaller fleets that rely on public charging. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Kevin. Uh, that's a really great comment. And uh, Bruce or Craig, would you like to uh, respond to Kevin or do you have any information about the infrastructure and how what we're doing to keep up with uh, the deployment of zero emission trucks? So I think Annalisa may be the best to uh, ah. to address that piece. And that's what I heard most of in that comment, so. Sure. Well, sure. Um, that's actually uh, absolutely um, spot on in terms of um, importance of uh, keeping pace uh, between the deployment of the, um, trucks and infrastructure. Um, the Energy Commission has been primarily tasked with funding infrastructure and also assessing um, how much is needed. Um, there are a number of programs already uh, in play and more coming that are going to focus on making sure that we have enough infrastructure for medium and heavy duty vehicles. Um, through the Energize program and through additional funding that's coming through the California budget. Um, and uh, I will, uh, I, I hear you and, and the Energy Commission hear, hears you about the um, critical importance of the uh, public infrastructure. I'm encouraged that when we speak with truck stop um, companies, they see this as important. They are starting to um, develop plans for converting uh, or adding uh, charging and hydrogen stations to their truck stops. And um, they are recognizing the business case there and um, looking for opportunities for funding, recognizing the uh, availability of low carbon uh, fuel standard credits uh, for public stations. And so I think we do have a path forward to create that ecosystem that supports the trucks. Um, but you're right, it, it has to come, effectively, it has to come first, um, because if you don't know where you're going to fuel your truck, it's very hard to make the purchase, make the decision to purchase that truck. Um, I really appreciate the comment. Yeah, I, I, thank you. I, I appreciate you saying that the infrastructure needs to come first. I think that that's where we are at this point. Um, we, we don't want to deploy trucks that won't be able to charge. That's, you know, kind of our worst case scenario. You can have a good truck technology, but if you can't charge it, then mm -hmm. it, it's it's not a good truck te technology. So, yeah. And so one of the things that we're um, we're talking about with our partner agencies is how to start um, facilitating the conversation between uh, truck owners and fleets with utilities and with infrastructure providers so that we can plan for that as um, as expeditiously as possible. If um, infrastructure providers know where the fleets are that want to be adopting sooner rather than later, that's helpful. And especially important is talking with utilities about what it's going to take to get infrastructure into communities that have fleets that need it um, so that the, um, the grid upgrades can start taking place, um, the interconnections can get scheduled, all of those the many steps involved in getting infrastructure in place. You know, and if I could just jump in, something that I find really heartening, um, because you're right, you know, infrastructure is is uh, is a, is a challenge. I'm hearing about more and more small entrepreneurs. Uh, in fact, I'll probably be talking to one in the next day or so that have a small fleet, um, looking at buying zero emission vehicles. They own their their lot, their land. They're looking at putting in charging and opening that charging up. Uh, as a you know to to others as well, so it's not just the big guys. People are pe people are really looking at how to solve the problems. Thank you, Bruce, and thank you, Annalisa, for answering that um, great question, Kevin. Thank you for asking. All right, so uh, Katie, are there any other questions um, that we want to answer? Yes, at we do have some in the Q and A. Okay. So Matthew Smith asks, what can CARB do to assist fleets or utilities and the California Energy Commission to streamline permitting process for charger siting with the various counties, cities, and local utility jurisdictions? 
Okay, so this is now permitting processes. Um, so would this also be for Annalisa? In terms of permitting processes for chargers? Sure. Um, my computer, can you hear me? Okay. Yes. My computer's starting to overheat. <laughs> Um, I may have to go off video. Uh, so, um, yeah, let me do that because it's distracting. Never mind. Um, so permitting, absolutely, that's another one of those critical path um, actions that's involved in getting uh, infrastructure established. And um, the uh, Governor's Office of um, Business Development, GoBiz, has been uh, focused on this uh, particular activity over the last few years and has developed a permitting guidebook that helps um, uh, local uh, permitting entities uh, walk through the process or understand, fully understand how to streamline permitting of infrastructure and um, also helps other uh, uh, stakeholders in the process, the, the infrastructure provider, the fleet, um, understand the process of going through permitting. Um, and they also act as a facilitator. So if there are instances where permits are getting hung up, definitely reach out. Um, reach out to one of us, Bruce, uh, myself. Uh, we can connect you with the folks at, um, at GoBiz who have helped by making a phone call to a city uh, permitting office to find out what the, um, what the hang up is and see if there's ways that we can unstick permits and um, move uh, particular projects uh, more quickly and more effectively. Thank okay. you, Annalisa. Um, our next one from the Q&A is a comment from Jasmine. She says incentives to finance the buying of zero emission trucks. Thank you for your comment, Jasmine. Our next one is from John. Can CARB explain the strategy for zero emission vehicle trucks in terms of large versus small fleets? ACF is a major effort and is focused on larger fleets. Is CARB suggesting tonight that support and incentives will be focused on smaller non-ACF regulated fleets? And ACF is the Advanced Clean Fleets Regulation, just for anyone listening. Yeah, Olivia, would you like to take that one? Um, I, I could start it and then I'm sure Craig or Bruce can jump in. I would just say that we're not only interested in helping out smaller fleets, but over the past year we've heard that those are the fleets that will need the most assistance with making this transition. Um, and also just to, to answer to the question about the advanced clean fleets regulation, there is um, proposed requirements for drainage trucks which could include smaller fleets. So it's not just those larger fleets that will be um, affected by the proposed regulation. It will also touch those, those fleets that are, are, are include trucks that are going in and out of the ports um, and sometimes are smaller fleets. So we, we really wanna make sure that we're creating support programs that will assist um, with their transition to zero emission trucks. Um, Bruce, did you wanna add anything or Craig? Yeah, I'll, I'll I'll jump in first, um, and and we ab we absolutely are looking at how to help smaller fleets. I mean, we know that we need to help all fleets, um, but we have a couple of programs that are just starting out that are aimed specifically at small fleets. That's some of the things that we're trying to get information about tonight. Uh, you know, what trying to get ideas. What will help those fleets, uh, you know, what kind of programs will help them the most. And again, while our incentive programs are, and, and, and our other efforts, our non-incentive efforts are aimed at everyone, uh, even some of our incentive programs that already don't, or that don't already uh, possibly have a fleet size limitation are starting to look at, you know, restricting upper bounds of fleet sizes to get the funding. But uh, as Olivia said, and it's a, it was a great point to make, you know, we know that 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 everyone needs help in this kind of, you know, this this new world of Zevs. But as always, small fleet owners are are going to need, uh, you know, a lot of assistance, and that's what we're here for. Craig, did you have anything to add? Yeah, you know, let me just um, point out one more thing: that the Advanced Clean Fleets does 
um, look to the, the, the local cities and the counties and state agencies um, that have these medium and heavy duty trucks and um, they will be transitioning to zero emission. Uh, and as they do transition, uh, you know, they will be installing infrastructure and, and providing, uh, I, I, don't, I don't know where that infrastructure will be. It might be at city parks. It might be at, uh, uh, you know, Caltrans mentioned that maybe some rest, rest, roadside rest areas along the way, but, but there, there will be uh, looking at the, the local cities and counties as part of the ACF regulation will help uh, smaller fleets, um, hopefully, um, you know, develop their, their long-term, uh, the short and long-term plan. So I just wanted to throw that out there. Thank you, everyone. All right, Katie, would you like to um, answer the next question? Um, sure, I'll I'm prompt, sorry. I'll prompt Ask, the next question. Prompt the next question, yeah. <laughs> I knew what you meant. Okay, so our next one is from Monica. Is there a report that shows if it's profitable to make the change to zero emission for small fleets? I have heard many people in the Valley say it's not profitable for small fleets. No trucks are available. Charging station and miles for the charging are difficult. Um, I can start answering this one. And again, you know, Bruce or Craig, you guys could jump in. Um, as far as profitable, I think that there's there's been a couple um, studies showing that the cost of ownership over time will end up being lower than um, operating a diesel vehicle. And we also offer um, cost of ownership calculators on our websites. We can maybe link to one of those on that Zev Truck Stop um, webpage that I mentioned earlier. We have some links to those calculators as well so people can kind of plan out and figure, it, figure out what their costs will be. Um, Bruce or Craig, did you want to add to that at all? And I, I feel like I only answered part of that question, so maybe you'll have to finish. I, I, no, I think you hit some of the really good high points. I just want to maybe uh, um, reemphasize something regarding our assisting small fleets. Um, and I think part of the question said, you know, they're hearing from small fleet operators, especially in the in the valley, that um, you know it's difficult to get into these vehicles, and and that is exactly what. Uh, you know, we are trying to help folks overcome now with incentive funding. You know, yes, you know, incentive funds for for a long time have been used more by larger fleets, but then they were helping pre improve that technology. Small fleets didn't have the, you know, the resources. They they wouldn't have wanted to to prove new technology. The technology is out there now. Um, and again, that's exactly why we are looking, why we're doing things like tonight is to try and figure out how to build best help those small fleets if I can talk. Craig? Yeah, and I'll, I'll, I'll just add one more thing. Um, you, you know, people are scared because they, they hear these, these early uh, cost estimates for, for electric vehicles. And uh, that's just because there's not that many, many of them out there. Uh, as more of these trucks um, roll off the assembly line, uh, we fully expect these prices to come down. As a matter of fact, I think Ford the Ford Lightning pickup, the electric pickup is only, I don't know, it, it's either just a few thousand dollars over what a normal F-150 uh, truck of, of equivalent specs would be. Um, but yeah, so I think when manufacturers hit production levels, uh, we fully expect these prices to be, um, you know, come down dramatically and, and probably at parity with conventional trucks today. All right. Thank you, everyone. So moving on to our next question, Ray asks, I'm a small business. How can I get help in Spanish? Um, that's a great question. So we actually do have um, a diesel hotline and we have operators that are standing by that speak Spanish um, and they can help you find resources that are available. And we also have our Zev Truck Stop page that we mentioned earlier. We did just recently translate that to Spanish as well. It is a work in progress. So as we include more resources, we'll make sure we um, update the Spanish translation. Um, but yeah, I think the uh, first place for you to, to look is our diesel hotline. Um, and maybe Stephen, you could drop that into the chat now. Um, and folks on that hotline can help you find available resources. 
um, and they can um, they can find um, folks that could help you at different uh, that are working on different funding programs that might be able to um, walk you through that process. Um, does anyone have anything to add? Tab, do you? I don't know if there's any other resources we could possibly share right now. Um, specific to zero emission trucks. I'm not yeah, sure. No, I was going to say come in or also send an email to Moving California or, you know, we have lots of Spanish speaking um, staff at CARB too who are happy to talk one on one. And um, I know many in the hotline, but we, we will connect uh, you with the folks that can help one way or another. So great. Yeah, can we maybe get um, the Moving California email dropped in the chat as well? Perfect, thank you. Okay, so the next question is from Akiko. I've heard that tracking incentive program availability and application timing and the process of applying for incentives are onerous to small businesses who need to focus on their energy and resources on their operations. Is CARB considering simplifying the incentives and grant application process or providing technical support for application and reporting after receiving incentives? Yeah, that's that's a great question um, regarding the technical capacity of the smaller businesses um, and help with those applications. So that's also very good feedback for us. Uh, Olivia, would do you have an answer for um, Akiko? Yeah, I mean, I don't have really an answer. I think that's just a really good comment and something we mm -hmm. want to get better at. But one resource I do want to point out is the Funding Finder website. Um, that's kind of, that's a really great place to start. That will where you can put in your zip code, um, what kind of funding you're looking for, and it will spit out what's actually available at this time for you. Um, I will, I will also say just reaching out to like the Moving California email or getting on a phone call with someone and kind of, um, you know, using, using what's available to you as far as staff time, just having us help you figure out what you could apply for. Um, that would be a great place to start as well. Uh, maybe we can drop the funding finder tool in the chat. Um, also, I'll just say that that is on the Zev Truck Stop webpage, and we've also um, included a summary of some of the funding programs on the Zev Truck Stop page in the incentives section. I'm also trying to include the um, websites anyone's referencing in response to the questions in the Q&A. So if there is one you're interested in, just go into the Q&A and look under the responses to those questions, and they should hopefully be in there. Okay, great. Thank you, Katie. Okay, and Veronica asks, will you be holding additional listening sessions? So I know I would like to, and actually that's one of our last questions for everyone today, which we're gonna get to. Um, we would like to do more of these. Um, we'd like to kind of um, do some meetings that are a little bit more focused, smaller groups. Um, so maybe we can dive into these questions a little bit more and have kind of a free flowing conversation. So um, at the end of our meeting today, please answer our poll and let us know that you're interested in that. That one will actually be, be a Zoom poll. So everyone should be able to um, answer that through Zoom, not through Poll Everywhere. Um, and, and if you don't get to that one, that's also going to be in our follow-up survey. So please respond to that and we'll be reaching out in order to set those up. Um, we're going to be doing surveys. We're really in kind of a a feedback mode right now before we start working on these programs. So, so yes, this is just the first of many. Thank you, Olivia. All right, and the next question is from Philip. To improve funding prog programs, perhaps consider removing first come first served incentives and instead set aside funding by geography or air district across the state. It seems a lot of funding ends up in the South Coast area or in the Central Valley, but more funding is needed throughout the state, particularly for smaller fleets. Yeah, thank you, Philip. That's really good feedback for us. Um, we'll definitely take a note and take that back with us when we're considering all the feedback. Yeah, that is good feedback. I will say that there is, um, I know that HFIP is, um, it hasn't launched yet, but they're going to be doing a set aside for small fleets. Um, there's also um, new requirements for a number of our funding programs to prioritize disadvantaged communities. 
So that um, will make sure that the communities that you know aren't get, are a little bit underrepresented or do have worse air quality that funding is is going to those areas so that we have cleaner trucks. Um, and then something I just want to uh, bring up as well is um, we're looking to make sure that um, we can show where this funding is going. So that's something that is in development as well, so that we can actually see where these funding programs are funding trucks throughout our state. Yeah, thank you, Olivia. Um, so we're doing what we can to make sure that all our programs are being more equitable. So thank you again for that feedback. And we are definitely working on improving that. Um, all right, so uh, would we like to move on to the next question? I thought you meant question for the polling and I totally spaced oh, it out. I'm so sorry. <laughs> no problem. Okay, so our next comment is from Paul. How long are batteries going to last and replacement costs of batteries? Often cars need replacements at tens of thousands of dollars, often more than replacing the car. Are we robbing Peter to pay Paul? Are we going to rely on dirty electricity, coal, nuclear, et cetera, to charge these trucks? All right, let's see. Um, would Annalisa be the, the person to answer this question? Well, I can start on the question of um, the uh, electricity. Um, California has in place uh, policies to uh, make our electrical grid increasingly renewable over time. Um, so right now we're um, we're uh, moving away from the use of coal, even uh, moving away from the use of natural gas, and um, as the grid. Uh, capacity increases, um, we won't be adding new coal um, to uh, to create that electricity. It'll be um, coming from renewable sources. So we're making sure that the energy policy is synced up with um, our transportation policy uh, to have an overall positive benefit um, for climate change and emissions. In terms of the battery replacement, there may be somebody else who has a better uh, yeah. So, yeah. So, Annalise, I can I can help answer that question. So, when we look at um, medium duty trucks, um, the 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 manufacturers have have told us that the you know the, these trucks have, you know, might get 150 300 thousand miles on them, uh, and the batteries uh, are are will last you know the the life of the truck so to speak. Similar to you, you buy a, a light duty car today, uh, the batteries are pretty much. Um, guaranteed for the life of the vehicle. It's when you get into the, the heavy, heavier duty trucks uh, that go, you know, 500,000 miles or, or more, uh, where you, you, you run into the, the need to, to swap, do a battery replacement at some point. And um, yeah, that, I mean, it's it, when we looked at the cost and the analysis, we understand that. And it's, it's no different than having to rebuild your engine uh, at the same uh at the same milestone. So a lot of these, these larger trucks, they do go through several engine rebuilds. Uh, they may have to uh, similarly have to um, maybe do a battery swap at some point in their life. But, but those costs, you know, when, when we're looking at, when we're looking at the, the feasibility of, of a lot of the, the regulations we put together, we, we factor all of that stuff in. Yeah, I just wanted to add one thing too to what Annalisa was saying on the, you know, the dirty electricity piece. And I don't think a lot of people know this. Um, first of all, uh, as we developed our greenhouse gas programs, the very the first ones that we started developing, uh, there was a limit set for what was called the renewable portfolio. And that required that by 2020, California's electricity uh, supply be at least 33% from renewables. We actually met that target in, I believe, 2017, maybe 2018. So we were early. We're somewhere around 40% renewables right now. And when I say renewables, that's not including, uh, you know, that that's not including things such as such as uh, uh, even small hydro. Um, it's pretty much wind and solar. So we're uh, we're on a pretty good trajectory to be carbon free. Awesome. Thank you, Bruce. Thank you, Annalisa and Craig. All right. So I believe we have a raised hand and another question in the Q&A. So Katie, take it away. 
So there's one more comment in the Q&A, it's from Lauren. It sounds like some on the ground sessions would be helpful also. So thank you for that comment, Lauren. And then LaDonna, I will unmute your mic and it should also prompt you to unmute on your end. Okay, there, you can hear me? Yes. Okay, yes. Okay, so LaDonna Williams, all positive as possible. So um, I wanted to bring it back to, um, I, I believe it was Olivia, where you mentioned, um, you did mention the disadvantaged communities and you went on to mention and say, you know, you guys want to make sure that all, you know, all basically communities, I guess, or folks have access to these programs. And so we've said it in the numerous meetings before, but I think we can never say it enough. And that is the fact that there has to be um, a priority focus or um, an urgency when it comes to the disadvantaged, particularly historically disadvantaged communities that have been left out of this process for, you know, what is pretty much what, 12 years since they started with these pilot projects and these incentive programs that did not reach our historically and continually to be disadvantaged communities when it has come to the funding, the resource, the knowledge, the training, all of the above, we're starting 12 years behind. So I'm hoping, um, and I really appreciate, um, what is his name, Bruce? Bruce, yeah. is it Bruce Tutter? Tutor? I apologize if I'm mispronouncing your name, but it, uh, what I hear is that you guys have heard us because he has mentioned the small fleet, the small business owner, you know, those folks are there. There are so many issues that for those truckers that we're hearing um, boots on the ground as what has prevented them from being able to, you know, um, even maintain the business. They've had to go and start, you know, driving Uber or doing other things because of the blocks that's been in place and the lack of resources. So, you know, although I know your intent wasn't to say, you know, we're all starting at the same place, I just want to keep emphasizing that those that have been left behind require additional resources and help that that is funding, other non-funding as well, but funding sources that keeps up with inflation. Mm -hmm. I, I appreciate all these billions of dollars that, that we're hearing is coming down the pike or has been signed off on, or at one point months ago, what was it, $600 billion surplus that, that uh, the governor has announced that we have. Uh, however, we don't see it in our poor communities. We're not seeing that. And as they put together these HR 40 that focuses on EJ and disadvantage and hearing the agencies from CARB to our air district and water and, and whomever EPA say that they are committed to closing the gap when it comes to the inequities right? So they have these equitable and, and uh, inclusion programs, yet nobody seemed to have thought, well, maybe we need to put a moratorium on some of these expenses when it comes to, um, you know, increasing the fees on how much you pay for a truck or even the permits so that the average person or, or middle income or lower income can even keep up with it. You give, you give out the incentive, yet if you're giving out a $2,500 incentive or discount, or, or let's even say 10,000, but the truck has increased by 10, 15 or $20,000, it still puts them out of range, as well as the basic needs now, you know, for, from toilet paper to rice is three, four times the amount of what we're paying because of the pandemic, inflation, mismanagement, all of the above. It is a sign of the times that we're in. If we're really talking about helping uh, um, the poorest of the poor that has been excluded out of this program, we need to be placed as a priority or that protective class who is being made, I wouldn't say being made whole, but at least giving us a fighting chance to begin the process of catching up. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. LaDonna. Uh, 
definitely appreciate your comments um, and we do hear you. And I wanna emphasize, we know that not every community is starting off at the same place. Um, we definitely recognize that some communities have significant advantages and others have significant challenges. So I really appreciate that you've been coming to so many of these card meetings and advocating for your community and really highlighting where we need to improve and what, what those barriers are for you. So um, again, really appreciate you coming here, highlighting those uh, particular challenges, and we're gonna do our best to make sure that we're focusing on uh, your community and other communities that have been historically overlooked. Um, that said, um, I don't know if uh, Tab or Bruce, if you all wanna comment on some of the suggestions that Ms. LaDonna had I'd like to maybe quickly. And first of all, LaDonna, you did pretty good. You missed it the first time, but you got it the second time. Most people <laughs> don't get it at all. So thank you. I appreciate that. Um, you know, and as I said earlier on the on the financial incentive side, especially when it came to the, the new technologies, um, you know, we, we were we were concerned and I think small fleet operators were concerned that, you know, they weren't ready for those technologies yet. We know that that people are now and that is why we're really looking at, at how to help them um, on the on financial side, um, one of the things that we've taken as uh, really taken to heart for, well, I've been doing this almost 12 years now. Um, one of the things we've really taken to heart is providing assistance. And it's previously been on our on our diesel regulations. They were complicated, but providing assistance, even one on one assistance to really focus on small fleets because they, again, were the ones that needed the most assistance. So we've always taken that to heart. We know we can do a better job getting the information out there. We talked on the phone a number of months ago now. Uh, you're, you're a great local resource to try and help get the information out to some of the local folks. We're trying to tap into more resources like that. We are starting a program where we will be uh, providing information to fleets of all sizes on what they need to, to start transitioning to zero emission. And again, we wanna make sure that that's as helpful to the small fleet uh, as it is to the large fleet. So I think you know, you're know you seeing an, a, a kind of a recognition and alignment across the agency. Uh, you know, Now that smaller fleets really are, or I should say the technology is really ready for small fleets. Um, I think you're seeing that kind of alignment. Tab? Yeah, thanks, Bruce. I also want to acknowledge Ms. LaDonna. We've heard um, on lots of different calls too the need to really reach out. And I'm hearing prioritizing um, historically burdened and disadvantaged communities, but in particular, Black communities with a focus on Black truckers. And I think that's something that we've heard a lot in some of the other um, meetings that have been maybe more light duty focused. And so definitely bringing that up in this forum and acknowledging, um, you know, we need to do a better job on focusing on that. And um, I, I'm happy that we've been able to talk with you more and, you know, I think getting suggestions on how best to do that. Um, we would love to, to chat with you more on that, but um, I know that we've been doing some looking at, uh, you know, we, we know, who the communities are. Um, I think making sure we're partnering with the right folks to do the outreach, and we've heard a lot of that today, you know, and I think community based organizations is going to be important. So thank Can you. Can I? For I, I was just going to say, and thank you. I appreciate that. And Bruce, I think we met with you guys, was it last year, year before? We've met with so many folks at this point. I apologize if I forget the names, but I, through it all, let's just say we're seeing some positive movement forward, which we absolutely appreciate because that means you're listening to us. Um, but I think CARB would do well also to not have such a narrow scope and lens of who they think the Black community is. They've done, you know, showings in West Oakland where they've had the trucks and stuff there. All of those are absolutely great Um uh, things to do to bring it to the community, but we are so much more bigger than just West Oakland and, and folks that CARB is comfortable with. You know, there are so many other struggling, and I mean struggling, 
um, black communities and black truckers that, you know, have fell through the cracks. And so, you know, I appreciate you, Tabitha, mentioning that. Um, and so we want to just keep moving forward with it and keep it in the forefront. But absolutely. And I think, again, you know, um, the audit shows, you know, who has been least supported in these last 12 years in trying to do this. So absolutely, we want to keep that conversation going. And we do have folks that are actually on this call that, you know, because of these uh, meetings, and if there is a question, so I'll answer it if I forget to put it in the survey at the end, but more of these meetings are absolutely needed so that this information can get to the folks. And, and a lot of times it, it requires repeating the, the same information so that folks can begin to understand. For instance, you mentioned the ZEV project and the additional resources that are available in there to keep hearing that really helps folks who are trying to come up to speed and, and figure out what opportunities are available. But we are committed to this. We have community members that are boots on the ground and ready to, to be part of the solution and not just complaining. Thank you, Ms. LaDonna. Okay, All we right. have one more question in the Q&A. Uh, Nawi asks, are there links to those studies about truck cost? All right, maybe we can get one of the staff members to drop that in the chat. All right. Um, so Olivia, before we wrap up this portion, do you want to show some of the results from the poll or should we move on to the next oh, one? Oh yeah, I can just scroll through them really quickly. Let's do that and then we'll do our last question. Um, so there we go. So I think it will just scroll through slowly. Perfect. And again, we're noting all of this feedback. So thank you for everyone um, who's been either putting their questions in the chat, raising their hands and dropping their feedback in these polls. Um, we have a number of ways to get your feedback and we really appreciate it. And again, if you weren't able to use the poll everywhere today, uh, Olivia will be sending out a survey at the end of the meeting and you can fill that out and it'll be emailed to us. So there'll definitely be multiple ways uh, for you, your voice to be heard. All right, let's see. So public facing DCFCs, credit card readers, um, charging as a service, expanding HVIP. Yep, equity and DAC needs to be expanded greatly. Awesome, so we are seeing some themes here. Accelerate ZEV adoption, workplace charging. Mm -hmm. Excellent. All right, so it looks like we had a good amount of responses, about 18 responses there. And again, we're gonna take this feedback with us um, as we uh, brainstorm solutions to getting everyone to zero emission. Um, but that said, so we're also interested in figuring out what next steps we can take to further encourage the transitioning of trucks to zero emission technologies, but beyond those that are affected by the proposed regulations. So there is an effort going on right now to understand the impacts on the clean air efforts of Senate Bill 1 statutes of 2017, uh, which prohibited CARB from adopting new regulations requiring commercial vehicle retirement, replacement, or retrofit before the end of the vehicle's useful life limit. So staff is looking to hear innovative ideas uh, for how we can move forward in our efforts to accelerate that use of zero emission trucks without the use of regulatory strategies. So there will be a workshop um, this August on the, on the 11th and we'll have that information for registration on the chat right now. So that's gonna be a public workshop to discuss the SB1 report. Again, that's August 11th, uh, 2022. And we'll have that dropped into the chat. And so that said, uh, we have one more question that we'd like to discuss with you all. And that is what strategies should CARB or other state agencies explore to encourage the adoption of zero emission trucks? 
So it's sort of the same thing um, that we've been talking about here, uh, but we want to we want to open it up for discussion. Again, Olivia is putting the question up here. You're welcome to use the poll everywhere, but we will also be opening it up for discussion now. So you're welcome to start dropping uh, answers or questions mm -hmm. in the Q&A and raising your hands. And yeah, I, and Diane, I just wanted to add as well, um, this was one that we did have a couple examples because we are looking for innovative strategies that might be beyond even just CARB's jurisdiction. Um, this report that's going on is looking for kind of California's next steps to encourage zero emission uh, truck adoption beyond our regulations, beyond um, funding programs. So some, some ideas that what they're looking into right now are um, differentiated registration, which is um, different registration um, for different vehicle types. Um, some of the ideas were green zones, um, which is barriers around certain cities where only zero emission trucks might be able to come in. Um, so these are some of the ideas um, that we were thinking and that this report is going to start researching. Um, let me see if I can pull up some of the other. Oh, so okay. we also, um, oh, you have them, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Do you wanna read yes. them? Yeah, of course. So some of the examples uh, that Olivia mentioned were again, the green zones, uh, differentiated registration, also recognition programs such as awards and privileges for zero emission truck use. Uh, another option is increased incentive funds for purchasing new vehicles and increased publicity of available support programs. So those are some ideas that we had and we'd love to hear your ideas or your support for any of these ideas that staff had as well. Awesome, thanks Diane. <laughs> no problem. Okay, it looks like we have a couple results. Um, there's three in there. We will let's let's throw those on the screen and see what people um, bought up. All right. So increase uses and purchases to lower prices and get manufacturers to increase production. All right. Green zones. All right. Support for some green zones, increasing that availability of charging. Definitely a strong theme we've seen tonight. Uh, bury highways and do more research on differences between zero emissions and diesel trucks. All right. And it looks like we do have a hand raised on this topic. Do we wanna do some questions? We don't have too much time, Diane, so we will probably need to start wrapping up in that three minutes, but. Okay, yeah, take... let's, let's answer Philip's question and um, then we can move on. Cool. Okay, Philip, I'm gonna prompt you to unmute. Great. Well, thank you. This is Philip Gibbons calling from the Port of San Diego. I don't have a question. I just wasn't going to type uh, my uh, my innovative thoughts here, so I just figured <laughs> I'd, I'd say them to you. Right. Um, awesome. A couple of just ideas, and I, I don't know if they're innovative or not, honestly, but just some things that we've been thinking about down at the Port of San Diego um, to encourage more ZEV adoption is uh, perhaps reducing sales tax burden on on zero emission truck purchases as as you know these are expensive trucks the sales tax therefore is a lot higher on them so um limiting that sales tax burden could be helpful another thing that we've heard and i think i read it in in one of the chats tonight is that a lot of the truck drivers are worried about payload capacity and i know that with a zero emission truck you can get up to 82,000 pounds over the road but perhaps there could be increased weight limits over the road. Um, love to hear any thought about that if there's, as time permits, maybe up to 90,000 pounds. Um, so that might be a way to in, encourage, encourage those. Kind of similarly working with uh, DOT on priority access or dedicated lanes along freeways, highways, or freight corridors, and even at the border crossings where people can get across the border uh, more smoothly. And I'll just stop there. So thanks, thanks for the time tonight. Yeah, thank you so much, Philip. Um, excellent suggestions. I thought they were innovative. Um, so thank you. All right, so I think that might be all the time we have. So we're gonna wrap it up. I know that we still have a few questions and comments in the chat. So we'll make sure to follow up with you if you did um, have a pending question or comment. So 
Thank you again so much, everyone. Uh, we're going to wrap up our conversation, uh, and we will also be able to find a survey link, and it's going to be pasted in the chat so that you can answer um, our questions and provide feedback that you want to give us on your own time. So with that, I'm going to ask Jessica if she can summarize some of the themes that we heard today. Sure. Hi, everybody. Um, thank you so much for participating. Um, there have been several CARB staff, including myself, uh, who have been furiously scribbling notes um, as the conversation has progressed and as we've been watching some of the responses and uh, viewing some of the chat and the Q&A questions. Um, so rest assured that we um, did get everyone's feedback. Um, we are processing it all and we're going to make sure to Put all of our notes together. Um, the recording will be available on our website and uh, Olivia has also said that she's going to uh, post the results of um, our polling questions here and you will have more ways to give us more feedback um, as Olivia is going to tell you more about. But I, I just wanted to kind of uh, give everybody a little bit of a closing the loop kind of feedback to tell you some of this, the main ideas that I've heard. Um, and again, I'm, I'm not gonna repeat everything we said because we had a, a great long conversation here, but just to kind of capture some of the main um, themes that I've heard. Um, so when we talked about challenges, um, the thing that I heard quite a bit was uh, an express, people expressing concern over the lack of infrastructure, whether that be uh, publicly available or on their own land, um, whether it's fast enough, whether they have access to it, um, if it's properly located throughout the state, there was a lot of concern about making sure that those zero emission vehicles could get charged or refueled appropriately. I also heard people saying um, that there's a concern about the higher cost of the zero emission vehicles and also availability, not only of used vehicles, but new vehicles and used vehicles alike. Um, we also heard um, concerns about uh, the, the grid and um, how we make sure that elect the electricity is available for, for, uh, for battery electric and hydrogen for, uh, for fuel cell vehicles. In terms of um, overcoming those barriers, I heard a lot of people mention um, reducing red tape either at the, um, the uh, permitting level, um, at the purchase level, at the incentive level. Um, we also heard a great need uh, for incentive funding. I heard people say a lot more incentives were needed. I heard several people say that. Um, and the other thing that I heard was outreach, 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 and then a little more outreach. Um, so I heard uh, getting in touch with community members, um, getting in touch with cities, uh, meeting people where they are in the community where they work um, to have that one-on-one -on -one connection with them and working through uh, associations like CTA and involving groups um, like, like our youth groups and um, uh, community groups that um, are interested in being part of that zero emission future. Um, I also heard that um, equity is a key component of what we're doing and that we need to um, continue to and focus especially on prioritizing um, groups that have been traditionally marginalized or left out of the process of um, incentive funding and also increasing training awareness and access in all of those areas um, and making sure that that's a key component of whatever strategies that we uh, choose to um, enact. And I also heard that we need um, more listening sessions like this one and maybe even a little bit different and varied in format um, with uh, more meetings and more listening sessions so we can receive feedback, offer new information, um, and that we can also look into different ways to get that feedback um, beyond poll everywhere. We've got some uh, uh, different methods that we should try out and uh, really uh, expand our horizons there so that we're really um, getting input from a lot of different stakeholders um, who may not prefer one or over the other. So um, let's see, let me just check my notes here. I see boots on the ground and getting help with documents. 
um, looking into different technologies and different ways that we can streamline processes, um, collaborating with other states, um, making sure that public charging is available um, first and is out ahead of the trucks. And yeah, lots more outreach. That's what I, that, that's the main thing I'm taking away from tonight. Um, so uh, like I said, we did collect all of your feedback and we will be aggregating that into our notes and, and considering that as we move forward. And now who am I turning it over to next? Uh, Olivia. All right. Olivia and thank Kingdor. you for that overview. Actually, we're going to, we're going to hand it to Anne-Marie first. And then oh my gosh, I'm out. so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Getting <laughs> ahead here. <laughs> uh, thanks, everyone. Yeah, I, I just want to say uh, from, you know, from all of us, really, on behalf of the team, I want to sincerely appreciate, we sincerely appreciate you joining us tonight and providing such great feedback. We know there's no silver bullet. We know that there's no, not a one size fits all. Um, we're looking forward to establishing some partnerships with a lot of the folks here and digging down and getting our rolling up our sleeves on some of the suggestions that we've heard today. Um, we really, really want to make our programs as efficient and useful as possible. We want to make sure that the, the end user is getting what they need from CARB, from big fleets to small fleets. Um, we're 100% in this with you. So really just say thank you so much for being with us this evening. All right. Thank you, Anne-Marie. Um, and thank you, Diane and Jessica and everyone that took part in the meeting today. Um, so we really encourage you all to continue to share your concerns and your suggestions for supporting this transition to zero emission trucks. Um, so you can email us at movingca at arb.ca.gov. Um, you can also still email the Incentive Program Advisory Group. They're accepting feedback at their email address IPAG2022 at arb.ca.gov. Um, and then to find more information about all of the resources that we shared today, you can visit the Zev Truck Stop webpage that I talked about, or you can go to the medium and heavy duty fleet zero emission vehicles purchasing support webpage. I know that's a mouthful, <laughs> but we're going to share those two links in the chat one more time and you can um, uh, just click on those or copy and paste it maybe to your to a word document and then you can they can visit those later um, we also created a survey that includes all of the questions that we asked today um, that way you can take a little bit more time thinking about your answers um, you can share it with any of your friends or if there's other people that you know are passionate about zero emission trucks and getting them out there um, you could share it with them um, so we're going to share that in the um, chat as well when we follow up next week with the recording, we'll also follow up with that survey again as well. Um, and then if you would like a certificate for participating today, you can also email us at Moving California, or I'm sorry, movingca at arb.ca.gov. We're happy to um, put your name on a certificate and that way you can um, you know, take that and you can show that you've been helping to um, create these programs. Um, and then as I mentioned earlier, there is an upcoming educational opportunity next week on Wednesday for truck owners. Um, so that's on August 3rd and you can register um, through the link that we shared earlier. Um, you can also find links for that on the Zev Truck Stop page that we've been mentioning, um, or I'm sorry, just on the Truck Stop website that um, you can find on Zev Truck Stop, but we'll share the link for that. Um, that one's gonna be really cool. It's a day long event. Um, there's several different sessions on different regulations. There's a session on zero emission trucks. There's a session on funding. Um, there's a session on off-road regulations and other things like that. So um, we hold those about twice a year. Um, so our, our next one is next week. So if you know anyone that needs a refresher on those programs, we would love to have, to have you join. And then um, finally, so if you're interested in taking part in smaller, more focused um, discussions on these same talk topics. Um, we're gonna launch a poll right now. And so we're gonna actually do this one through Zoom. So it's a little bit easier for you to answer. Um, so we just want you to answer with um, kind of who you are, um, what your stake is in this um, push for zero emission trucks. So if you're a truck owner, you could just put, you know, I own this many trucks. This is why I care about what's going on or, 
I care about clean air and I want to talk more with you guys about this. Um, don't worry about including your email or your name. Um, that will be recorded as you answer. Um, but yeah, so that's launched now. So please um, respond to that and we will be following up with you. And then finally, I just want to say thank you everyone to everyone for participating. Um, we're going to stay on for a couple minutes. And so if you have any more questions or comments or you need um, help finding any of the resources we mentioned today, um, we can help you out with that. All right. So thank you. Thanks, everyone. Oh, looks like LaDonna raised her hand. All right, um, LaDonna, I will unmute you and you should get the prompt again. Okay, Um. oops. Where did you say the, uh, I thought you said it was gonna be on Zoom, the, the last question that you guys were asking. I just see what's next, but I don't see a questionnaire. So, um, so we have the questionnaire, which we um, shared in the chat. The last poll that came up, that is just a, a question asking if you want to take part in, in discussions going forward. Um, so there's that one's just about if you want to take part in like smaller, more focused meetings. Um, oh, okay, and that's that, and that's yeah. what I was referring to. All I see on here is what's next. I see continue to share your concern. There is a link, but there was no uh, poll. Oh, it didn't pop up for you? No. Okay. I did see that three people responded. Oh, so okay. See, see, my my screen is not showing it. It's just mm -hmm. showing, well, showing me now. It was just showing you, and okay. it shows what's next. But the poll never popped up. Okay. Well, um, should we end it and and should we end it and restart it again? Maybe we could try that. Um, we could also just you know if people want to do that, just right in the chat right now or the q a and we will make sure we reach out to you yeah okay I, and i yeah. was just yeah. i was raising it because i just want to also be sure maybe i need to do something in my settings as to why yeah things aren't question. popping up on mine it could be on my end i'm not sure um, yeah it should come up as a, as its own separate window and it might be yeah. like if you minimize zoom maybe it's like behind your zoom window somewhere Okay, let me see. So that's funny because I was gonna suggest that we use these polls instead of poll everywhere next time, but maybe not. Yeah, maybe okay, let's see, I came in. Too. Yeah, it's still just showing what's next, let's see. Weird, okay, you know, it's actually interesting because it says four people answered out of 23, but there's still 40 people still in the meeting. So maybe some people don't have um, access to doing polls. It if might like. Okay, panelists can't respond to polls so that's why the oh, okay. number is that but LaDonna oh, okay. also if you try to click more and then it might be okay yeah there. let me see but I know okay, I've cool. I've been using zoom for a oh, while and sometimes okay. it's a little complicated into, normally like on the other um meetings that I have and it could be I probably have burnt my port uh tablet out but normally it'll pop up on the screen on here yeah. Um, I now have a more screen that's usually incorporated into my other uh, parts where you go in. And this poll just popped up at, when I tried to refresh, it pops up as poll and qu quizzes. So I'm, I just learned something new. It's okay, new. Cool. I don't normally see it there, but normally it would just pop up on the page, wouldn't it? Yeah, yeah. normally. Ah, okay, okay. All right, well, good to know. Thank you, yeah, thank you for that. Yes, well, LaDonna, we definitely will be reaching out to you. I mean, we are trying to create some technical assistance programs um, that we definitely want your feedback on to make sure that, you know, they're useful. Okay, okay, I appreciate that too. Thank you. You LaDonna, guys have a good night. Uh-huh. <laughs> do you have on the bottom um, next to like the Q&A box, is there something that says polls that's got like a chart on it? <laughs> Uh, not on the Q and A. No, as a matter of fact, um, my Q and A says it closed. It, it didn't even allow me. Like I was trying to type in on the Q and A, mm -hmm. for some reason, it didn't allow me to even do that. Yeah, because I've got a little button, and it looks like a graph chart, and it says polls, and I clicked on it, and then the question came up. 
Yeah, well, that was under, that shows up under more for me. Okay. Yeah, for me too. Yeah. I'm, it might be like different versions of Zoom. Yeah. That's ah, that could be it too. Okay. Yeah. Well, Donna, were you able to find the follow up survey? Just because I want to make sure. Um, this first one here, the it just says one question. Is there another survey that you guys sent? What yes. I did on that one, I just copied the link so that I could do it later. Yeah, that's the one um, we want. I, I just want to make sure you got that one, the one that you can copy the link because we want your feedback for sure. And then I, and if you want to share it with anyone, that would be great too. You can send that link to anybody. Okay. Okay. Yeah, we'll do that. Great. All right. And we'll Thank set it you. out again with the recording. So if you like. Oh, yeah. okay. Okay. Yeah. That'll work. Thank you. You guys have a good evening. Okay. Thank good night. You. Okay. Good night. All right. Carp team. Thanks everybody. Or is everyone else gone? All right. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Have a good night. You too. Good night. Good night.